All right, ready? Yes. First, let me know if you can hear. Can, I can, can hear. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Ready? Yes. I'll start it over. Okay. You know what you should read? You know what you should read? You know what you should read? It's time for What You Should Read, the podcast all about the titles you need. Join three book lovers and a guest as they cover all the best new titles to enjoy with your team. <laughs> Composed and recorded by Violet Gray. Oh, thank you, Violet. Thank you. You know what you know what you should read. You know what you should read. You know what you should read. It's time for what you should read. The podcast all about the titles you need. Join three book lovers and a guest as they cover all the best new titles to enjoy with your team. I have that, but I haven't read it yet. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm Rachel. And I'm Kelly. And this is What You Should Read. The podcast where we should all over our books. With a spiffy new intro song. Yes. The best, the best ever, I think. <laughs> Recorded by the lovely and talented Violet Gray. Um, very excited. Uh, yes. I, think, I feel like it's the start of us having a brand. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. We have arrived. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're a real podcast now. Yep. <laughs> okay, well, I'm really excited to be recording today's episode. We are having our second book club episode. If you might remember, our first one was The Book of Two Ways by Jody Pico. And today we are discussing Silver Sparrow by Tayari Jones. And we'll be joined by a special guest. So we will get to that a little bit later. But first, Kelly, what are you reading? Well, I am reading Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers. It's wonderful. I love it so much. I started it last night. I'm now um, about, I have about 150 pages to go. I, I love it so much. I actually would really like to just finish this right now. It's good to be here with you guys. I'd rather be reading. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's so good. And uh, we'll be talking more about it next week. So I don't want to, I don't want to say too much about it, but I love it yeah. so much. I will be borrowing that. Yes. Yes, you will. <laughs> Rachel, what are you reading? Well, this weekend I decided to try to get as much um, as I could read of the Reluctant Royal series by Alyssa Cole. Mm. So I'm I finished A Princess in Theory, and I'm in the middle of A Duke by Default. Um, so I'm hoping to finish that today. It probably won't, but um, as soon as I do, I'll read the third one, A Prince on Paper. So having a lot of fun with that. Cool. Well, I am reading Legendborn by Tracy Dion, and it's um, a not a King Arthur retelling, but it's like a continuation of the legend of Merlin and King Arthur. And I can't really say much more without spoiling like the world she's built, which is so intricate and mind blowing, honestly. And um, it's like first world fantasy, I think is what you would call it. It's set in our world, but there's a magical element to our world that you know other people don't know about. And that's my favorite type I think a fantasy novel. Um, and in this one, the main character is Bree. She's 16 and she's at Car North Carolina State in like this early college program because she's a smarty pants. And she like discovers magic and <laughs> this group of people who are doing weird things. And also she's dealing with the death of her mom um and the book does several things really well um it definitely does the whole fantasy element really well the writing is beautiful um I think it uh does a really good job and books with Shay actually talked about this on her channel when she was reading this book like it just captures the black experience really well um and also um grief 
is really um, like the way the characters deal with grief. So Tracy Dion is just doing so many things so great, I think, in this book. And I'm about 200 pages in. It's a 500 page book. <laughs> so it's really long. Um, and there's an audio version too that I just started like going back and forth. So I'm enjoying that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that sounds like that's definitely on my to be read list because it sounds yeah. really good. Um, I also forgot to mention, I just finished an audio book, which um, completes one of the Bachelor Reading Challenge prompts. Ooh. So I read Milltown by Carrie Arsenault, which is a nonfiction about um, the towns surrounding where we grew up in Maine. And the it covers a lot of different topics actually and almost in a way that wasn't cohesive enough for me. Um, I enjoyed the book because it was beautifully written first of all like the prose is just like I mean it was it definitely painted a, a beautiful picture of this uh, area that we grew up in um, the people and the landscape and everything and it was funny to kind of hear her interviewing people that I know <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, I really want to read that. And mm -hmm. I'm sure we have a lot of people in common with her. Yes. And um, so anyway, it, like I said, it was not quite cohesive, but it did, it did cover a lot of interesting topics. And um, I think if you, I don't know if I hadn't grown up in the area, I think a lot of it might've gone over my head just in terms mm. of like the context yeah but it was it was still really good I enjoyed it um and I don't can you borrow books on Libby like can you send and uh, not Libby Libro FM like I can you know because I could try to send it to you if you want to listen to it um, I'll just buy it I'll buy it like yeah. on Lib that's a good idea to do an audiobook um I'd love yeah. to get her on the podcast I don't know her personally but mm -hmm. um I'm sure like I said we know people in common yeah, she's closer to our mom's age. Right. Um, but um, yeah, it meets the prompt, the hometown date prompt mm -hmm. to read something set in your hometown. So. That, I think that's the one I was going to choose too. <laughs> yeah, <nice>. yeah. <laughs> we don't have much to choose from. <laughs> no. we, when we were the Kennedys by Monica Wood would count. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Kelly, you're up. Well, we have a lot of book news. Uh, first of all, Rachel is taking part or in creating a Taylor Swift readathon. Um, we have tweeted and Instagrammed about it, but I'll have the link in the show notes. It looks super fun. And there are a lot of prompts, even stuff that aren't book related for some reason, I guess. So everybody can do this challenge, literally everybody. So it's super awesome. Good job. And um, I just uh -huh. wanted to make sure that we talked about it on the podcast too. Definitely. And yeah, it takes place from March 1st to March 31st. It kicks off on February 28th, actually at noon Eastern Standard Time. We're going to, ha we're going to have a live show on YouTube. Um, so, and I'll be participating in that in some way. So be sure to check it out. And yeah, we just reading all month long. You can, um, it's, there's a, it's like a bingo. So there's a bingo board and you can get one of the albums um, like 1999 or Red or whatever um, by meeting one of the three possible prompts for that album. And each album does have a non reading related prompt just because we wanted to make it accessible you know, some people read a lot and some people don't read that much. So we want people to be able to get a full bingo, even if they only read one book, they can still get some of their bingo boards um, by not reading, but doing like reading adjacent things like be cozy or <laughs> post a picture of your book on Instagram or something like that. So and that's nice because then you can get all the squares, even if you, you know, no, not that you have to, but you could. You could. I'm going to try. Mm -hmm. I have nine books lined up. I'm going to try. Ooh, we should share our TBRs as it gets closer. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so that's super cool. Tis the Damn Readathon, which I think is the most <laughs> fun title ever. I love it. Yes, me too. 
like I had anything to do with it. It's so genius. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to glom on. Um, um, oh, sorry. I said happy to have you. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, today is Kindred Spirit of the Pods, Becky Farr. It's her birthday. Um, it is actually several days past her birthday while you are listening to this, but the day we're recording, it's her birthday. And it's really great to get to celebrate Becky because she is the literal best. Mm -hmm. And if you saw on Instagram, uh, Julia wrote and shared this absolutely lovely post and Becky put it in her stories and talked about how great we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> proving nice that, of her. Yeah. <laughs> proving that everything Julia said was true. Oh, Becky is the best. We love you, Becky. Happy birthday. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. And uh, you, you know how much I love complaining and arguing. The other <laughs> super fun bit of book news. So Jezebel had an article this past week where the writer was complaining that book people are ruining books. And I know. <laughs> and it's, it's the most nonsense argument because she's angry at people that post on Goodreads and talk about audiobooks and e-readers and bookstagram and everything and that classics aren't being taught anymore and nobody reads them because they're hard and complicated. And I generally love Jezebel. It's, it's one of my favorite snarky sites, but I think they absolutely got it wrong this time. And there was an article on Book Riot basically refuting mm -hmm. every single point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think what, th there were a couple things that really bothered me about the Jezebel article written by Joanna Mang, uh, dramatically titled, We Have to Save Books from the Book People. <laughs> <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> well, first of all, she connects her dislike of book people, which she includes bookstagrammers, booktubers, people who do book hauls, um, people who collect books. That's who she's talking about, us, um, yeah. basically. Um, she connects that to the disrupt texts movement. And both, like, both things are fine, right? Being a bookstagrammer is fine and good and fun. Yeah like chill out it's a hobby yeah. um the disrupt text movement is completely separate and and very important mm -hmm. yeah. to help bring awareness to diverse texts and disrupt the canon and it's just such a nonsensical argument there was one part where she said <laughs> like the arrogance is just crazy is like with this commitment to generic democracy comes defensiveness. Book people often feel they're being demeaned or mocked for liking genre fiction or listening to audiobooks. They feel that way, Joanna, because they are being mocked in mm -hmm. this article that yeah. you've written. <clears throat> yeah. It's ugh, gross. <laughs> I almost felt like it was like two different articles too. Yeah, because yeah. It starts out talking about reading classic literature in high school and how like she's like people falsely blame being quote forced to read these on the reason why people don't like reading after high school and all this stuff and it's like well I can't I don't think you can say that's not a contributor to that when people are just like shoved a book and say read it and you're getting graded on it and aren't given any sort of like real stimulating you know context to you know why this book might be you know something that they can relate to you know one of my best friends is an English teacher and she talks about you know teaching the classics alongside teaching newer books and like making connections and you know in her school that it's she also is a co-teacher with the history teacher and it's more of a humanities type mm -hmm. of class and, you know, that's where we need to be heading is, you know, not just the same old, you know, the same old thing every year, year after year. But then she completely switches gears and starts talking about book people. And it's like you said, Julia, she's trying to connect the two things when they have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. It's like, 
people making book trees are not why kids don't like the great Gatsby. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I really didn't get what her, even her point was like, what are you trying to accomplish with this article? I don't get it. Her point was, I want to be annoyed by book people yeah. and I want people to agree. And the funny thing was a lot of the comments were like, oh, I love audiobooks and I've been writing on Goodreads too. And I was like, haha, all the book people yeah. <laughs> are just commenting as if she's like one of them and that's going to make her more mad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well. Gotta love a good discourse. <laughs> well, one of the one of the trends in book for book people, as she calls us, is read more classics. Like that mm-hmm. happens all the time. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just <laughs> it's like there's a whole podcast. Um, oh, what's it called? Novel pairings, where they mm-hmm. every episode they talk about one classic piece of literature and then they pair it with different, more contemporary works that are either have similar themes yeah. or remind them of it or just like gave them the same feelings. And it's really interesting. Yeah. Joanna needs to chill. Yeah. <laughs> but people have their hobbies. Yeah. <laughs> They're not hurting anyone. Nope. nope. <sighs> All right. So let's talk about our recent acquisitions. Um, Julia, you've been excited to share yours. So what have you recently acquired? Um, I just got what Jane Austen ate and Charles Dickens knew by Uh Daniel Poole. It's just a bunch of facts about 19th century England. What? (laughs) I know. Um, And I'm excited to just have it as a reference, you know, because I love Jane Austen and Dickens and, you know, I'm a gasp classic <gasps> literature <laughs> you're a book person it doesn't make no. sense. it doesn't make any sense um and then I also got concrete rose by yeah, Angie Thomas so fine my copy finally came in um cannot wait <laughs> oh so good Kelly what about you well it was a very busy week <laughs> <laughs> Um, I got eGalleys for Survive the Night by Riley Sager, which is out in July, and Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid, which is out in June. I have already read both um, because they are two of my most anticipated reads, and I was like, I'm I'm not letting dust go on this one. Mm -hmm. Um, Both are just as amazing as I could have hoped. I just absolutely loved both of them. Um, I got a poetry collection called I Am the Rage by Martina McGowan. And I read that too. I was yeah. doing very well this week. Yeah. Um, and if you are, me. <laughs> I mean, that's generally not true, but I will take it this one time. <laughs> um, but if you are into poetry, absolutely read this it is just amazing and powerful and moving and I I loved everything about it I'm going to be rereading it a bunch of times this year I think because I just I was very very impressed and I loved it yeah and uh much later than you my book of the month boxes came except for the one with Kristen Hanna so these are basically Except for Girl A and the Kristen Hanna, these were all the offerings uh, this month. Uh, So I got Honey Girl, which I'm reading now, as you know, uh, The Kindest Lie, The Bad Muslim Discount, The Infinite Country, and I need one more hand, Send For Me. (laughs) And they all look really, really good. I think The Kindest Lie is probably going to be my next Mm -hmm. uh, book of the month read, but I don't know that for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. I also, in addition to picking up the Reluctant Royal series, I also got my book of the month box and I got The Kindest Lie. Awesome. And Bad Muslim Discount. I agree. I think The Kindest Lie is going to be next for me, although I'm also really... Um, I don't know. There's so many books I'm excited to read and it's hard to pick which one. Yeah. Uh, 
And then The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna also came out. <gasps> so I'm excited for this one, but sneak peek, I am going to use this as one of the books for the Taylor Swift Reader Thon. <gasps> so I can't pick it up until mid, uh, March. <laughs> so. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Okay, so we are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are going to be joined by Shernay Phillips, uh, who has been on the podcast before and is coming back. We're super excited. And we're going to talk to Dr. Nay about the book Silver Sparrow by Tayari Jones. So stick around and we'll be right back. You know what you know what you should read. You know what you should read. You know what you should read. It's time for what you should read. Podcast. And we are back to discuss Silver Sparrow uh, by Tayari Jones joined with our brilliant friend, Dr. Nay Phillips. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming back. Uh, Silver Sparrow was released in 2011. Uh, here is the synopsis according to Goodreads. With the opening line of Silver Sparrow, my father, James Witherspoon, is a bigamist. Tiari Jones unveils a breathtaking story about a man's deception, a family's complicity, and the teenage girls caught in the middle. Set in a middle-class neighborhood in Atlanta in the 80s, the novel revolves around James Witherspoon's families, the public one and the secret one. When the daughters from each family meet and form a friendship, only one of them knows they are sisters. It is a relationship destined to explode when secrets are revealed and illusions shattered. As Jones explores the backstories of her rich and flawed characters, she also reveals the joy and the destruction they brought to each other's lives. At the heart of it all are the two girls whose lives are at stake, and like the best writers, Jones portrays the fragility of her characters with raw authenticity as they seek love, demand attention, and try to imagine themselves as women. Hmm. Hmm. So, um, Dr. Nay, once again, thanks for joining us. We're glad to have you. Yes, welcome back. Thanks. We're so glad to have you back, and you actually recommended this book to us last time you were on. I did, and I'm so glad you had a a chance to read it. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for suggesting it. And um, so we're kind of going to go around and I'll give our general impressions of the book. So why don't you start start for us, um, Dr. Nay? So I really love this book on so many levels. Uh, One, because I now live in Atlanta, and it's set in Atlanta, and it's set in real a real neighborhood in Atlanta (laughs) and um my colleagues who actually recommended the book to me like you know like yes set in southwest Atlanta and you know the the mall I can't remember the name of the mall Greenbrier Mall I want to say I can't remember god they're gonna when they listen to this be mad that I messed up (laughs) the mall but the but it's set in, in a real neighborhood in Atlanta that people find you know just nostalgic and I love that because I'm still getting to know the city but also the writing of course is great and the storytelling is great and the characters I feel connected with on a deep and personal level because you know actually I hadn't shared this with you last time but in a very weird and twisted way the storyline kind of mirrors my life in some ways Mm -hmm. um yeah it kind of mirrors my life um although like my sister to this day still doesn't know I exist so um wow uh (laughs) but it I just felt like oh my gosh this is kind of like my story in a way minus the the affair part (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) with you know that part's not there but just having a sister out in the world who doesn't even know I exist and so I related to that in so many ways and my heart broke <laughs> for yeah. you know for for the daughters and for the relationship that they might have could have had had their parents been you know more responsible or just in some ways better parents <laughs> you know mm-hmm. uh, so I related to that on that level as well um, I found it to be eerily raw and just real you know because sometimes when when people write these stories and it's not their personal experience it just doesn't it it doesn't feel real to me but I feel like Tayari really nailed just like the emotional turmoil that comes with being the the other child you know Mm -hmm. I think she really captured it well there wasn't a moment in reading the book that I felt like it wasn't authentic 
even though just knowing a little bit of what I know about Tayari, you know, to my knowledge, this is not her story. This is just completely fiction for her, but I feel like she really captured what it really feels like to be in that position. So mm -hmm. I loved it wow. on numerous levels. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, it makes sense why you um, kind of recommended the book in that you connect with it so much. Yeah. The author also says in the acknowledgments that actually after the book was published, so many Silver Sparrows reached out to her and she was amazed just at how common this story really is, you know, because it's in secret, we don't really know how common it is, but I think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a lot yeah. more common than people think. Yeah. yeah. When I share my story people say oh my gosh I have a you know a sibling who doesn't know me and I'm scared to say something to that person it's because it's it's a very frightening thing even though as the the child you didn't do anything to kind of cause this right situation. but there's still this fear of rejection you know uh with just telling your truth so the, yeah there are lots of silver sparrows in the world mm -hmm. yeah well, I agree. This book was uh, beautifully written. And like you said, just so real. Um, it It isn't my story either, but I can think of several people I know who have this story as well. So kind of similarly, when I read it, I said, oh, I know this person. And it, it, yeah, like we were saying, it's just more common than you think. Um, I also just love how Tyree Jones writes about American families in these impossible seeming circumstances. Um, in this book, it's a secret family. In American marriage, the husband is wrongfully convicted of a crime and how that affects their marriage. And so I can kind of see that thread through her writing and she does it um, so beautifully and masterfully. Um, and I just, the characters to me were so vivid. I felt very uh, well-developed. Um, and even though what I loved most was how the stories of these adults were told through the children's eyes. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to get into that more later, but that was just something I loved about the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciated that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would have liked it as much if it had been told from Yeah. The it would have been a different story, right? If we had been hearing it from James's perspective, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It would be interesting to hear him justify everything he did, <laughs> and by which I mean absolutely infuriating. Yeah. Um, I also loved it. I loved that Atlanta, in a lot of ways, was a character too. And the way they kept comparing it to like a small town where everybody knew everybody, not unlike Baltimore, where I live and where you're from. Um, but yeah, like it's, I just thought it was such a really good, really real story. And um, I kind of have a little bit of a similar situation. Um, I have a half sister. We each know about the other. We've, we are Facebook friends, <laughs> but our relationship is basically, oh, hey, happy birthday. She's a full decade younger than me. And I mean, maybe, maybe we'll end up having a closer relationship at some point probably not just because I feel like a lot of times if you're super different people it's more like the shared childhood and the fact that you know your parents and your family like if you don't have that cement you know how close yeah. are you ever really gonna be mm -hmm. but it's weird watching people with their sisters having a really good relationship like you guys, and then just being like, I will probably not have that. But I do have my best friend who has been my best friend for like 33 years. So I kind of do. Mm -hmm. Damn, you know what? That's so funny because yeah, my best friend, I've had, I have two really long term friendships, one since we were 11 and the other since we were six. So those, I don't know, I can't do math right now, but <laughs> over 20 years <laughs> of friendship. And so, yeah, I have that, even though, you know, it kind of, it breaks my heart that I don't have that connection with the sister who doesn't, and maybe we could, I don't know, I'm too scared to even mm. try to go down that lane, maybe one day I'll have the carriage, but right now I'm really content with my 
good girlfriends who I've known for nearly my whole life. So yeah, chosen family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Chosen family is the best. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I agree with all of you that I, I, I think it's a great book. And, you know, I really enjoyed reading it because it was so um, immersive. And I really uh, felt that empathy that came through the writing for every character. I mean, even the ones that weren't, weren't the greatest, you know, you at one point, at least throughout the story felt um, some sort of like empathy or sympathy with the characters. And I I also like that it was told through the story of the daughters um, and how you kind of got their split. Um, And, and that, I guess I'll talk about it more later, but it was interesting. I do want to talk about the um, similarities and differences that uh, between the girls' relationships with James, mm. because um, in some ways their relationships with him were very similar to one another, and in other ways, of course, it was different. But yeah, I thought that was that was interesting. So yeah, I mean, speaking of kind of diving into some topics. Um, One of the big topics in this book um, is secrets. So everybody (laughs) seems to have at least one secret that they keep from their family. And so why was it so important for these characters to hold these secrets inside? Like keeping these secrets seem to be like so important to everybody. So why is that? I think one thing what you were saying, Sharnay, was like the fear of rejection. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think for some of the characters might've been a big um, fear. But with James, I kept thinking like, obviously bigamy is against the law, right? Like, so that's a reason for him to keep it quiet, mm-hmm. but that's not a reason for the families not to know about each other, right? Like if he's, you know, if if he wanted to reveal that, you know, he could be reasonably certain they wouldn't like call the cops on him, but that's not why he kept that secret from them. He kept it out of a sense of shame and this, I think, misguided um, feeling that his mother, it would affect her in some way. Mm-hmm. I don't, I think maybe that's what he used to justify it though. I don't know if that's really the real reason. I think the real reason might have been like, it would have affected his social standing. Like he, had built this business that was very successful. And I think he worried about how he was going to be perceived maybe a little bit um, or a lot. Yeah, because I kept thinking like, like, okay, you could have just like come clean, right? To Laverne when this when the babies were conceived around the same time. And instead you kept them secret and then married the other woman too and just decided to lead lead a double life um so yeah I think it was a combination maybe of not wanting to disappoint his mother but more so not wanting to disappoint himself and who he thought he was yeah and I think too though you know there was some a sense of he wanted to protect Laverne he felt yeah bad that you know just the backstory (laughs) <laughs> of their um of yeah their marriage and the struggle to have kids and you know I think he was a coward let's just say that but then to justify his coward <laughs> I think he thought well yeah. I don't want to it's on her mm-hmm. you know I, I've done enough and I don't want to put more on her so what she doesn't know perhaps mm-hmm. won't hurt yeah if she knows it, then she's definitely going to be hurt. And that's, the, I mean, that's a tired excuse that most people give when they lie and, you know, <laughs> deceive people. It's like, well, I don't want to hurt you. So I'm just going to withhold this information. Right. Yeah. And in a, in a sense, it's I'm withholding this information, but I'm also withholding the power. I'm taking power away from you. At least if I tell you the truth, then you have the power to set, to, to make a decision based on the truth instead of this lie that they're living. Mm-hmm. But um, I think how he justified it was, I don't want to hurt her, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. 
And then Dana learns to take secrets to keep secrets too i feel like she learns that from him because she has a lot of secrets i mean she's a teenager uh so that part i think is kind of normal mm -hmm. but yeah. she you know she sort of feels like well that's my life yeah my life is secrets it's normal mm -hmm. and especially I with her relationship with her um on again off again boyfriend in high school and just how she sort of accepted the mistreatment because she was like, well, I mean, this is, this is normal to me. Like, mm -hmm. um, sometimes he acknowledges me as his girlfriend and sometimes he doesn't, which is just like James and her mother. Mm. Just that generational pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think with James, though, he just really didn't want to have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And I like I, I think he just wanted both women and both daughters. And I think Gwen convinced herself that theirs was the like the real marriage, even if he wasn't with her all the time, the way he was with Laverne, mm -hmm. you know, like that was the real love story. But, you know, I, I think he just wanted I think he just wanted everything and you you can't have that like ever right he had it for a while <laughs> he did mm -hmm. but good. you know when it when it eventually explodes yeah. you know yeah you you can't keep everything forever no secrets eventually come out yeah um but speaking of you know secrets and keeping keeping Gwen and Dana secret from Laverne. Do we think she really didn't know? Because there's this part in the book when we first get to Charisse's, um, you know, chapters where Laverne is telling her this story about a woman who husband was cheating on her for a long time and it ended up that she knew the whole time. And the quote is like, the point is that Gracie knew the whole time. She just didn't act all ignorant about it. Um, and then later she says, men do things all the time that they don't mean. The only thing that matters is that he loves you. So what do we mm -hmm. think about that? I think that she probably knew that he had some type of relationship on the side. But I don't think she knew the extent of it. I don't think she, she knew he was married once. And that's just crazy. But then also had another child who's the same age mm -hmm. as their child. I don't think she knew that part, but I do yeah. think she had some idea that, you know, he might've had a girlfriend maybe on the side or something like that. Right. He's gone every Wednesday, <laughs> right? right. Yeah. yeah. I think she knew he had another child because there is a scene where she sees Dana um, oh, wearing the coat, right? She's wearing the same coat as Sharice is wearing and then she, she gets a look in her eye and Dana notices it. And in that moment, I think Laverne does know that he has another family. Maybe he doesn't know there's a marriage, but mm -hmm. she knows and she keeps it secret. And when Gwen confronts her, it, that scene is so heartbreaking to me because Gwen shows up at the salon. Laverne is feeling beautiful in that moment. She mm -hmm. has this dress on for her party coming up and she's very proud of, of her accomplishments and feeling great. And then Gwen, a silver girl, right, comes in so beautiful and airs the secret that Laverne probably deep down knew all this time, but was content to ignore. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I, I really felt for Laverne in that moment. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to, you know, um, think about that because there are, yeah, like you said, little parts in the book that I agree, I think she knew something. Um, and it's interesting because Laverne, she was so young when they got married. Yeah. Um, baby, 14. 14. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Just, and she lost her first pregnancy and you know, couldn't really have, couldn't conceive for a long time. And so, you know, Charisse was kind of her miracle baby. Mm -hmm. And a part of me is like, maybe she was like, 
oh my gosh, he had a baby with someone else, like, and the jealousy maybe sort of made her kind of tamp that down. So I can see it being a lot of jealousy. Um, but I also wonder at if he had come clean and said, I have a daughter with someone else and was open about it from the beginning, I almost feel like she would have embraced Dana mm -hmm. um, with open arms because I just feel like she would have been like, you know, every child is a blessing kind of an approach. Um, but where it was a secret, she felt more like, um, you know, yeah. made a fool of. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Well, and the fact I think that the, the girls were so old at that point, I mean, I mean, still very, very young, obviously, but teenagers, like, mm -hmm. this is something you have known and deliberately kept hidden for years, mm -hmm. like a really long time. And, yeah. you know, the fact that, um, the fact that he gave his daughters the same coat, like, you knew it wasn't like, oh, you just found out and now you're trying you know to deal with everything as best you can like you knew this whole time mm -hmm. and it feels like such a betrayal mm -hmm. I'm sure and I think also the fact that Gwen and Laverne neither of them had really good relationships with their parents right after after James like basically so mm -hmm. I think that also made it a lot harder because well this is this is all I have now Gwen is a secret too right yeah her dad remarried and had a new family and yeah that was she's a crazy. she's a silver sparrow too yeah yeah that whole scene where dana goes to her grandfather's house and he's talking to her and he knows who she is but he mm -hmm. doesn't officially acknowledge her and then when his new wife comes out he's like oh she needs directions. She's a stranger. And it's just, to me, so bizarre. Like, I didn't even know how to feel about that scene. Yeah. That scene resonated with me. <laughs> uh, that's one of those scenes where I said, yeah, she did, She got that right. Mm -hmm. and, and had it gone any other way, because I remember reading that scene thinking like, oh, she's about to mess this up. <laughs> because if he goes and says, oh, my lovely granddaughter like, as if he doesn't know that she exists you know like as if he didn't know that she existed all these years or you know as if he didn't abandon his own daughter you know um I think I would have stopped reading it <laughs> it was just that important to me that she got that right yeah she got it right yeah I, I, I felt that to be a very authentic uh scene mm -hmm. it was heartbreaking it was heartbreaking and I felt every moment of it, like just her walking in the neighborhood and just, mm -hmm. you know, every, really every scene from, uh, from Dana's perspective, I just felt it in my bones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was very raw and very real for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, having Dana's perspective and having Sharice's uh, perspective was, um, to me, really um, added a lot to the book. And I know, Julia, you mentioned earlier um, about getting the perspective from the daughters um, and not getting any point of views from the adults. So, um, yeah, I want to speak to that. I, I just thought that was interesting because so much of the book was their history, the adults in the story and, and Raleigh and James and, and Laverne and Gwen and their backstory, but it was always told through the daughter's eyes. And I read an interview with the author where she talked about how, well, we all have those um, stories that are told to us and that we retell, you know, like almost like they're fairy tales about mm -hmm. how our parents met and I'm like yeah I can I can tell you in detail how my grandparents met and like what they said to each other because I've heard the story and I like gobbled it up you know and saying and my parents and like how they got engaged like I could tell you all that um it didn't happen to me I wasn't there <laughs> so I just liked that I was like that feels real that the daughters would have all that info and maybe it's not true what they're telling or maybe it's filtered yeah. um or maybe they filled in the blanks right with their own 
uh, details. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's like you said, the story would be different if it mm-hmm. was from the parents' perspective, for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know, though, because I feel like when Gwen is telling Dana these stories, I feel like she's already putting it through that filter. Like, you know, even though we don't get him as much, we are the family he loves the most. We are the family he values. And I mean, a lot is made of the fact that they're the prettier wife and daughter, Mm -hmm. which I feel like Every time I think about that, like, God, poor Charisse, like, you know, but definitely. Um, Julia, you had wanted to talk about the significance of the title of the book. Yeah, because um, a spare, the reference to a sparrow, it's only brought up a couple times, um, you know, with the song, the gospel song his eye is on the sparrow like god is keeping watch over even the smallest creature or the most vulnerable creature and i just thought that was such a lovely um image and how you know dana is a silver sparrow she's a silver girl sharice's um reference to i forget what it's in reference to now um bridge over troubled water right the the song right um so yeah i just i love the title so much (laughs) Yeah, it is, it is a beautiful sentiment, honestly, and sad at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I like the Bridge Over Troubled Waters. Uh, I like that song. And that's actually my favorite part of the song too, like the Sail on Silver Girl part, but that's probably everybody's favorite. So it's probably not super significant that it's Gwen's favorite and Dana's favorite and Charisse's favorite and my favorite like it's everybody's favorite probably but it's it's still great and I don't care but they both mention it right they do yeah yeah definitely mm-hmm. um so in towards in the end of the book Dana says that Charisse couldn't see that even now she and her mother had won why does Charisse not see it that way um, Sharice at one point says that she and Dana share a father, but they are definitely not sisters. So I think, so what, what were you, um, thinking with that one, Julia? Yeah, I was just thinking like, why mm-hmm. does Sharice see, I, I was curious about what we think about Sharice's perspective mm-hmm. because with this question, because I I definitely feel a lot of empathy for her. This is a huge shock, you know, and it wasn't her fault. At the same time, Mm -hmm. I feel like she's unable to muster a lot of empathy for Dana. Mm -hmm. And that really, you know, I really wanted her to. And I understand she doesn't feel like they're sisters, right? They didn't grow up together, but it's also not Dana's fault that this all happened. Um, So yeah, I was just curious, like, what do we think of how she... I don't want to say she sees herself as a victim. She is a victim. Like this wasn't her fault and her fa- her father, you know, created this impossible situation. But the way Dana sees it, like she had it made, right? She had the good life, and got everything she ever wanted, which I think is kind of true. I mean, it's kind of true, but also like she, the entire life she thought she had ended up being a lie. Yeah. And she found out very publicly. Yeah. And it was, I mean, oh God, like when I think about how that would feel that you are at your job with your mother at her job and someone you thought was a friend came in and blew your entire life up Yeah, in front of probably what felt like half of Atlanta, but was really <laughs> only what four women. But it- Atlanta then knew right yeah. <laughs> it's because yeah. they keep saying it's like a small town word travels I yeah. mean I would want to die yeah and I would want to murder my father <laughs> so I, I mean she I don't think anybody won yeah but I think Cherie's definitely lost because she lost her entire childhood mm-hmm. 
I agree. I think from Sharice's perspective, it's like, well, what, what aspect of my childhood was real, you know? Mm -hmm. And then here's this, this, the sister who comes in her life as a friend <laughs> and it's like, well, damn, did you just come into my life to stir things up to make a fool out of me? You know, I think from mm -hmm. her perspective, it's like, I'd rather pretend that you never existed, <laughs> you know, so I can move on with my life as if you never happened. Your mom doesn't exist. My dad at that, at that point, at the end, he's not even dealing with, with, you know, her sister anymore or, you know, the sister's mom. So I think she just, it was easier for her to just pretend as if it never happened. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, Dana was a secret, but she knew the truth. Mm -hmm. Therese, yeah. The secret was being kept from Sharice. So when she found out the truth, it's like you said, you know, what, well, then what is real? You know, what else was I being lied to about? And I also think it's probably easier for her to um, direct her anger at Dana and Gwen, because otherwise the only other person to be angry at is James and that's her dad. And it's really complicated for her. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, like you all said, Dana knew the truth the whole time and the truth is what sets you free, right? Mm -hmm. Like she had a really rough childhood, but um, at least as an adult, it seems like she's processed everything mm -hmm. in a more healthy way, maybe than Sharice has. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe it's because she knew all along. I don't know. But I just felt, I felt like Dana never got to have, you know, the the family unit right. that Sharice did. And it just, I don't know. Yeah. Not that I, it's not fair to compare them. You know, they both lost in a way, but. And, and I can see definitely from Dana's perspective that she had to build her life around whatever Sharice wanted, because if they wanted the same things, Sharice was going to get it. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Doesn't even know I exist. I have to build my life around her. And it was just, that was really heartbreaking to me that James put them all in that position and that Dana had to make sacrifices yeah like I think Dana just wanted to be seen right yeah yeah, yeah. what was the um the after school program that she wanted to do oh, oh yeah, yeah. Sort of like stem program and yeah stuff, right yeah. I know the sacrifices she had to make for a sister that didn't even know she existed and it's right mm -hmm. oh. and her job James. at Six Flags I know <laughs> that she was so excited for and then like Sharice didn't even keep it and of course it turns out that the boss was horrible so right. it's probably good that Dana wasn't in that situation either but I mean and would it have been so bad if they were there together because it's not like it's not like Dana would have been picked up by James or anything like it would have been Gwen I think James probably knew they were um, trailing them. <laughs> so yeah. he's like, no, I can't even risk her being near Sharice. She's going to say something. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because Raleigh definitely knew. Uh, mm -hmm. We got to talk about Raleigh. Uh, that guy. <laughs> I love Raleigh. <laughs> but uh, he's an enabler, right? For James. Oh, old. for sure. <laughs> He, and I feel like Raleigh was so, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but he was just like, he, he was like, oh, well, I love Gwen. So I think it would be totally easy and make a lot of sense for her to love me back and for us to get married. And I just was like, where is that entitlement coming from? Like, I didn't understand him. As James's family is always his family, I think, because they've always embraced him. And I think that's just what he, that's just part of who he is. Um, yeah. But very is like, I don't know. Yeah. Raleigh definitely was truly in love with Gwen. <laughs> and I think maybe she were, she did regret, right. That she didn't meet him sooner, but um, yeah, he definitely kept all their secrets, all of them. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh, this book was so good. So yes. good. I know we had some questions from the like discussion guide from the author's website. Do we want to do some of those? Yeah. Um, I think I put them in the guide. Uh, the one that I know off the top of my head was something like, is there any way this book could have had a happy ending? And I don't think so. I really don't. I really wanted it to. <laughs> <laughs> wanted it to have a happy ending I, I was a little disappointed that it didn't but I I, I understood the ending the ending felt real it's mm-hmm. just I just really wanted a win for Dana yeah. mm-hmm. all win you know it just it was heartbreaking yeah she seems to be doing like fairly well in the in the epilogue I guess it is mm-hmm. where she has her daughter and is learning how to parent um, in a way uh, different from what she grew up with, with James, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, do we think Laverne's life is better or worse for having married James? And what about Gwen? And I think that's a hard question to answer for Laverne, especially because she was so young when they were married, but I mean, what do you all think? I would say both are better for having met James because Dana and Sharice both seem like good, interesting people. Hmm. I don't know that I would say they're better for having married James. Hmm. Um, but I guess also people like James maybe they both ended up making smarter choices after because it's like well this guy is awful maybe we should see what happens if we date people who aren't awful (laughs) do we think that Laverne should have left James when the truth came out yeah (laughs) isn't that because I understood on some level why, actually I don't, I really don't understand why she stayed. Mm -hmm. I don't don't get it because for most of her marriage, I think we we've come to some understanding that at some point she figured it out. Mm -hmm. He had some type of, he he has a wife, a woman on the side. At some point she figured out he had potentially had a kid on the side, but you ignore that because you want to keep up this image. Mm -hmm. Well now everybody knows you know, there is no image to uphold. Like everyone knows. So now this, here's your opportunity to live in your own truth and to have some respect for yourself. Yeah. I I just didn't get it. I didn't get why she wanted to keep up Mm. this, this image that was already shattered at that point. So I don't, I don't get it. I, I think I do. Cause she, she married him when she was 14 she didn't finish high school I mean realistically what is she going to do to take care of herself and her daughter like well she had the shop she had she had the shop but it was a skill very marketable skill yeah Yeah. but I don't Um, know I feel like maybe the answer is to stay with him and slowly poison him (laughs) oh do you think that it's because of Bunny. Like Bunny took her in. I feel like everyone has this um, devotion to Bunny, the grandmother, because she took care of everyone. Um, so I wonder if part of it is just like, um, you know, their family. Uh, mm-hmm. And Bunny was kind of the glue. And then and she died and then everything just. Yeah. 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 See, that's the thing too. When Bunny died, I'm like, girl, Bunny yeah. <laughs> They told Bunny the truth. Bunny was not okay with that. So, yeah. Why? (laughs) Why why are you staying in this? I don't know. Yeah, Bunny wanted it all out in the open once she learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I I saw this. uh, Oh, I saw in Terry Jones did these highlights and notes for Goodreads. And she said, a lot of people ask her who sent the telegram, the one that's like, bigamy is a crime. I'm going to, oh, yeah. 
And she always answers back, who benefits the most from that telegram? And so that made me really think, cause I'm like, who would benefit from like having the cops called on him? And I honestly have no idea. Raleigh making his Raleigh. big play. Oh, <laughs> like his oh. big play for Gwen and the company. Mm-hmm. Whoa. That's a really good point. <laughs> Because nobody else benefits from that. Maybe, I mean, I guess you can say Gwen. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. But then, like, no, because she she would go to jail too, knowingly mm-hmm. marrying a married man. Mm-hmm. So she would be in trouble. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, I mean, technically, Laverne could make a good case for like divorce and getting all of his money and shares in his business if he were to be arrested and jailed and any, everything. So she might benefit the most. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. So well, Riley Laverne. Yep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but she, and she's, by that saying that, she's saying it, it is one of the characters that we know. It feels like that's what Not she, like a neighbor. Right, like, cause I mean, we got that, who was it, Mrs. Green or someone who made, right. <laughs> she just made it all about her and like, I can't believe this is happening. It's like, this is not about you, <laughs> but um, yeah. Oh, I was just thinking that Mrs. Green with like the clapping and everything, it's like, maybe it was her. <laughs> maybe it was just like a really boring season and she's like, let's just see what happens if I do this. Yeah, just the neighborhood busybody. <laughs> yeah. Causing trouble. Yeah. Do we have any other, uh, Dr. Nate, did you have any questions that you wanted to pose? There is the, the other scene that was really hard was the party scene. Mm. Yeah. I know your thoughts on that when Dana, um, well, two, two actually. The, the scene where there, where Dana and, um, gosh, why are everybody's names? And, and Sharice mm-hmm. are together and Riley and Jane are driving to pick them up. Oh, yeah. That's oh, my God. Poor Dana. Yeah. I could feel her anxiety, right? I could feel the fear. Oh, my gosh. Yes. That scene, I'm like, are they just going to leave her here? <laughs> that was when I was like, done with James right like yeah like you cannot and Raleigh you cannot excuse that no way Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. and just the fact that like afterwards you know they wrote it off as oh she was on drugs her mother was crazy and you know a crazy ex-girlfriend of Raleigh's and um you know made Charisse think oh your friend was on drugs the whole time or something and it's just like so awful yeah poor Dana and and the fact that like she got a brooch from her grandmother who she never met and Charisse just took it and was like no this is mine and just she had one stupid thing Mm -hmm. why couldn't you let her keep one stupid thing Mm -hmm. That's why I really wanted some some happiness. <laughs> I mean, I know yeah. that you know she has her own kid now, and that's yeah. Cool. But I just wanted a win, like a yeah. real win for Dana. Yeah, like she goes to Mount Holyoke. Does she go to Mount Holyoke? I don't think we know for sure. Or did she go somewhere mm-hmm. else? Or because she ends up, yeah. I-, I wanted a dream come true for her. You're right. Mm-hmm. Like something she always wanted, and then she gets it. I think she sort of did get it because she didn't care anymore. Yeah. That's true. And I mean, I think that's a pretty happy ending that this this thing that mattered so much to you, I mean, you don't have it, but it also doesn't bother you anymore that you don't have it. I mean, that's not nothing. She yeah, deserves a better ending. I don't know that I believe that she doesn't care though. I don't know that I believe it. Maybe she maybe in this point in her life she she truly believes that that she's over it but how can you be when it yeah. defined your childhood so yeah that's so. true 
I really love Dana the most. I think she's my favorite character. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, and she's the only character that, you know, I didn't end up hating at some point, you know? Like I was with Laverne for a while and then I'm like, girl. Yeah. You know, never liked James. Never really liked Gwen either. Riley, there were moments where I was like, okay, he's loyal. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> But leaving, but when they left Dana, you yeah. know, that, that's, you know, in the middle of nowhere, it's, mm, Riley, yeah. not cool. Not okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely. Mm. Well, yeah, Bunny and Dana, the only two yeah. fundamentally good people. Oh, and the friend, Dana's friend. What was her name? Ronalda. Oh, yeah, I like yes. Ronalda. She's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, her story was tragic too yeah and actually there were comments on the goodreads that i saw that made me think a lot more about it too and the part where they're like oh it, when you have a son something about having a son versus having a daughter and i just thought about how heartbreaking it is that ronaldo's mother you know was so unhappy and mistreated her and then she had a son and all of a sudden she was a good mother for the son. Yeah. And left Ronalda. And there were actually a lot of comments on Terry Jones's Goodreads post about this that were like, this happened, I, this has happened to me or someone I know. And Terry Jones said that she was inspired to write that from when she used to volunteer at a homeless shelter. And she met a little girl, 13 year old whose mother was, you know, um, battling addiction and was uh, mistreating her a lot. And then um, had a son when the girl was like nine or something and got clean and, you know, hmm. bestowed all this love on him. And the little girl was just so angry. And so, and her mother's like, what do you want me to do? You want me to beat him too? And she said, why couldn't you have just got better for me? Why couldn't I have been enough mm -hmm. to make you get better? It, it was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think she just does a great job, Tayari, of just capturing so many different, as we were talking about secrets and, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. family dynamics and she touches on a lot, you know, even colorism, when you think about just oh, Raleigh, the, Raleigh. the how, you know, Dana and Gwen are supposed to be so beautiful and, mm -hmm. and Laverne and Sharice are not, you know, yeah. and, and what that means, particularly in the, in the black community. But the interesting twist on that is that, you know, here are these fair skin, long hair, they're the secret. <laughs> and usually in these books, right. they're the ones that are kind of put on the pedestal and not hidden. So that was an interesting twist on colorism that I hadn't seen. Mm -hmm. it's definitely not in anything. Uh, yeah. So. A good point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's just, <laughs> Tyaris Jones is just so good at, um, like you said, like, touching on so many different things in one book mm -hmm. and it just yeah wonderful Good. yeah so do we want to go around and kind of say our final thoughts uh anything that we weren't able to kind of get out in the discussion so final thoughts and your rating out of five stars um do you want to go first dr nay Sure, I covered everything. Great book, well written, covered a lot of topics and family dynamics and just, uh, <laughs> it, it felt so real to me in so many ways. I would give it a four and a half out of five. Can I give half stars? Yeah. <laughs> and I would give a half just because I never, I never give anything five out of five, four out of five, <laughs> because I don't believe anything is perfect. Um, I don't think it's a perfect book, but that's not a, you know, that's nothing against the book. I just don't believe in perfection, <laughs> but it's very nearly perfect. So four and a half out of five. Mm -hmm. 
um, I, I would like to go next if I could, because I want to counter that as we learned from the good place, things can be up to 104% perfect, which is how we got Beyonce. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to say, I love the absolute ending. Uh, and this is the last paragraph. People say that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but they are wrong. What doesn't kill you doesn't kill you. That's all you get. Sometimes you just have to hope that's enough. Mm. And I feel like that and maybe The Great Gatsby are the only two books I can think of that end just so perfectly. And uh, I, I would say five out of five. Yeah, I think this is a wonderful book um and i agree it's not perfect but it is very very good and i would give it a four or a four and a half out of five as well and i think if it if dana had gotten that win in the end maybe that would have bumped it up to a five but um i i cannot wait for her to write another book it seems like she takes time in between books so maybe it'll be a while before we get another one but um She's definitely a great American author, um, and I'm so glad I got to read this. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I don't think I have any other thoughts beyond just thinking it was a really great book. I also gave it 4.5 out of 5. On my Goodreads, you can't give half, so I rounded up to 5. Um, but on my story graph, <laughs> I put 4.5. <laughs> you can do it on that website. But... Yeah, I just, it was so great. Um, and we'll definitely read more by her. Yeah. Well, thanks again for joining us, Dr. Nay. Um, do you, where can, do you want to like say where people can follow you on the oh, social yeah. media? I have an Instagram account. I have Yay. 100 followers now. Yay! <laughs> One zero zero. <laughs> it could be one oh one. So it's Dr. Nay Phillips. D R N A E Phillips with two L's on Instagram. Nice. Cool. We'll link it down below in the show notes. So <laughs> good. Um, well, thanks again for joining. And um, yeah, it was great talking to you. Yes, thanks for having me. Of course. So that's our show. Remember, if you are interested in joining Book of the Month, you can get your first box for just $9.99 with the promo code what you should read, all one word. And our next book club pick will be Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. And we'll be reading that for an early April episode. So if you want to read along, be sure to um, read that book and send us any thoughts or questions or just talking points that you want us to include in the episode and we will have a very special guest for that as well I'm not going to tell you who it is yet <laughs> but be sure to follow us on social media Instagram and Twitter we are wysr underscore podcast you can email us at what you should read podcast at gmail.com and please give us a rating and subscribe to us where Wherever you listen to podcasts and now you know what you should read you're welcome Yay. Yay. you know what you, you know what you should read, read. You, know what you, should read. you know what you should read it's time for what you should read the podcast all about the titles you need join three book lovers and a guest as they cover all the best new titles to enjoy with your team